All right, let's let's do the flag slew. We we'll at least do this uh, tonight and next week. I, I kind of like doing it myself. I do too. Uh, how about everybody? We're in agreement here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all. Brother Henning, lead us in prayer, would you? Thank you, Father, for this country. Thank you that you have not abandoned us. And yet, as we pray, believing you will minister, send a great awakening across the land, I pray, not for you, your Holy Spirit. Touch us, Lord, I pray. We cry out to you for your help. Yes. We cry out to you for Washington, D.C., that you will minister there. Blanket that place with your Holy Spirit convicting power. May there be a mass turning to you. Holy Spirit, we believe you for your touch and your ministry. Bless this service tonight. Have your way in our lives. And the one who speaks, I pray you, he will know your anointing. which breaks every yoke of bondage. We thank you for every blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 may be seated. Thank you, Ronnie. I had mentioned last week about the folds of the flag and uh, so graciously Sister Alvaro had found this on the computer I expect and uh, typed it up for us and the granddaughter Which, was she, is she here the granddaughter here no she's not here next to her so dad I cut and pasted it, there's a big old long, long sheet. I said, well, I don't want you to have to do like a scroll. So I asked you to take it and break it down to be page by page, easier for you to read. Yeah. And she did that. And it's extra large print. That's yeah, really a print. Sure print. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm at that print. age. I need real, and this is great. <laughs> be sure and thank everyone involved, you especially, and everyone involved for doing this because this is something I will be keeping. The folding of the flag. Talking about the American flag, of course. Most Americans have seen the traditional folding of the American flag at specific events, such as funerals. Have you ever wondered why Old Glory was folded that way? Much more than just a pomp and circumstance, each of the 13 folds holds a special meaning. The flag itself with the portion of the flag denoting honor is the canton of blue containing the stars representing states our veterans served in uniform. The field of blue dresses from left to right and is inverted only when draped as a funeral cloth over the casket of a veteran who has served in our country honorably in uniform. By the way, there was some real discussion here a while back that they had unduly put a flag on a person and it was, I mean, it was known literally not only worldwide or no, America and worldwide, let me say that. And it raised a bunch of sand and it should have. This was a special thing that's only done for those that have the require, meet the required uh, requirements. So anyway, I want to throw that in right quick. Of course, there's a lot of things we're slipping on these days. That's one reason why I want to talk more about the patriotism that we need to have more in this country. In the U.S. Armed Forces, at the ceremony of retreat, the flag is lowered, folded in a triangle, and kept under watch throughout the night as a tribute to our nation's honored dead. The next morning, it is brought out and at a ceremony of reveille, flown high as a symbol of belief in the resurrection of the body. Meaning behind the 13 folds. The flag folding ceremony represents the same religious principles on what our great country was originally founded. The first fold of our flag is a symbol of life. The second fold is a symbol of our belief in eternal life. Isn't that interesting? Amen. The third fold is made in honor and remembrance of the veteran departing our ranks and who gave a portion 
of his or her life for the defense of our country to attain peace throughout the world. The fourth fold represents our weaker nation, nature as American citizens trusting in God. It is him we turn to in times of peace as well as in times of war for his divine guidance. The fifth fold is a tribute to our own country. In the words of Stephen Decatur, our country in dealing with other countries may she always be right but it is still our country, right or wrong. Amen. The sixth fold is for where our hearts lie. It is with our heart that we pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Amen. indivisible with liberty and justice for all. The seventh fold is a tribute to our armed forces, for it is through the armed forces that we protect our country and our flag against all enemies, whether they be found within or without the boundaries of the Republic. By the way, it used to be that our enemies were outside of the boundaries of our country. Right now, I'm sorry to say, we've got a bunch of them right now in this country. And some of them are in our politics some of them are in our government. I know folks don't like to hear that, and we think we're radical. If you don't believe us, just watch the news. Amen. Who would have thought we'd have some of those village idiots in a place of position? You say, well, that's not very nice, a preacher talking like that. I wish I could talk worse than that. <laughs> the eighth fold is a tribute to the one who entered into the valley of the shadow of death that we might see the light of day and to honor our mother for whom it flies on Mother's Day. The ninth fold is a tribute to womanhood. It has been through their faith, love, loyalty, and devotion that has molded the character of the men and women who have made this country great. Remember that? The hand that walks the cradle rules the world. Mm -hmm. Amen. I like giving tribute to our, our the women. Amen. <laughs> in fact, we're even having more for the women to do in the church than what we used to. I think it's about time. Mm -hmm. I know that won't go over too good with some of the guys that ordained me, but I appreciate the women's input that are spiritually minded. Mm -hmm. The tenth fold is a tribute to Father, who has also given his sons and daughters for the defense of our country. Since he or she was first born, the eleventh fold represents the lower portion of the seal of King David and King Solomon and glorifies the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The twelfth fold represents the emblem of eternity and glorifies God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I didn't know that. Isn't that great? The thirteenth and last fold, when the flag is completely folded, the stars are uppermost, reminding us of our national motto, in God we trust. Amen. And there be no red showing. After the folding ceremony, and after the flag is completely folded and tucked in, it has the appearance of a cocked hat, ever reminding us of the soldiers who served under General George Washington and the sailors and marines who served under Captain John Paul Jones and were followed by their comrades and shipmates in the U.S. Armed Forces, preserving us for the rights, privileges, and freedoms we enjoy today. The source and the date of original or the origin of this flag folding procedure is known. Excuse me, it is unknown. However, some sources attribute it to the Gold Star Mothers of America while others to an Air Force chaplain stationed at the United States Air Force Academy. Some sources also indicate that the 13 folds are a nod to the original first 13 colonies. The flag folding ceremony is provided as a patriotic service. I want to say this, I just found out today that in Portland, Oregon, last week, 
That's where they're having a love in, and they're having a, a get-together, they called it, or whatever it was last summer, burning, rioting, destroying, maiming, doing whatever else they did. I'm sure there were some people killed. And I understand that this last week they not only were burning the flag, but they were burning Bibles. Mm. Mm. Burning Bibles. Mm. Who would have ever thought that we would be living in a time such as this? I want to share something with you. The censoring of religious activities in public schools. In Supreme Court decision rendered in 1962 and 63, the inclusion of religious activities such as school prayer and Bible reading in major activities of daily student life in public schools was struck down. It was the first time in the history of the United States that any branch of the federal government took such a stand censoring religious activities long considered an integral part of education. I want to say this, when I was in junior high school on school time, they allowed us to leave the classroom, walk down the street to the corner church where we got school credit for Bible class. We were there anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half. We didn't just talk about God, we talked about Jesus, and we had Bible class at school time and got credit for it. Back then, we didn't have squad cars at the school. We had punishment, I believe it's called corporal punishment. They spanked us if we needed it. Mm -hmm. And my dad told the principal and the teacher says, you go ahead and do that because when he gets home, his mother's gonna do it and then I'm gonna do it after that. Uh -huh. Amen. Folks say, oh, you can't do that to my mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. No, nope. right now those children are out there burning the place up. Oh, I don't like that kind of talk. Look where we are. Mm -hmm. There's a lack of respect for everything. Government, for authorities, for everything. We've got adults now wanting to defund the police. Mm -hmm. We'll take a psychiatrist or psychologist out there. We'll handle it. See how well that works. The sudden restructuring of educational policies was participated by the court's Conversial reinterpretation of the phrase separation of church and state. That just makes my blood boil every time I hear it. As it relates to the First Amendment, which simply states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibit the free exercise thereof. The court decided that the First Amendment included a prohibition against including religious activities and public affairs in fighting skyrocketing numbers of lawsuits that challenge any presence of religion in public life. The court has already delivered far-reaching decisions to. Do you realize, once again, this country was formed on the Word of God? People came here for religious freedom, not to get taken away years later. Remove student prayer. Prayer in its public school system breaches the Constitution's wall of separation between church and state. And it gives the dates, 1962 for that one. Remove school Bible readings. No state law or school board may require that passages from Bible be read or that the Lord's Prayer be recited in public schools of a state at the beginning of each school day, 1963. When I went to school, we had prayer and flag salute mm -hmm. before we ever started class. Mm -hmm. The first thing we did because nothing else was done until we had prayer and the flag salute. Mm -hmm. Remove the Ten Commandments from view. If the posted copies of the Ten Commandments are to have any effect at all, it will be to induce the school children to read. 
meditate upon, perhaps to venerate and obey the commandments. This is not a permissible state objective under the established clause, 1980. Remove benedictions and invocations from school activities, religious invocations in high school, commencement exercises conveyed the message that district had given its endorsement to prayer religion so that school district was properly prohibited from including invocation and commitment exercises. And it gives all the dates. I want you to remember this. It's in Proverbs 22, 28. Also the Supreme Court of the United States at one time. I hope it's still there. Do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. Proverbs 22, 28. Some folks not going to like this, but in several months ago, we showed upon the wall the president counteracting this and allowing Merry Christmas to be back in the ranks of our speech and prayer in the school for those who wanted it and many other opportunities, giving the church once again more freedom back what we lost in 1965. You might want to look who was president back then too. Also with that communist Right now, let's do something, because I want to remember this passage, and I've got some other things to read. Folks say, well, when are you going to just start regular preaching again? After next week. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. Bravo, amen. We are trying our best to fight for America right now, mm -hmm. and we're doing the best shot we can with what little that we might be able to do, and as this goes out over the airwaves, providing that Facebook doesn't cut us off again. You all sing with me, would you? I'm satisfied with just a cottage below a little silver and a little gold. Where the ransom will shine I want a gold one That silver line I've got a little mansion Sing with me Just over the hill In that bright land where We'll never grow old. We'll never grow old. And someday on earth, we will never know. But walk on streets that are pure as gold. Though often tempted, poor men and and like the prophet, I pillow a stone. And though I find you no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion my own. Just over the hill In that bright land Where we'll never grow old And someday under We'll never more wonder But walk on streets that Or lonely, I'm not disturbed. 
have said. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your precious word because it's a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. And I pray, Lord, that we would take it more serious than ever. First of all, the freedoms that we have in this country that have been predicated by you yourself and your precious word. Let us remember it's not country first, but it's God first. Amen. May we not get the cart before the horse because this is a message that many are preaching today that it's America first. And as much as we love this country, it's not America first, it's God first. It's our families and then America to tell you the truth. And I believe that would be respected by all that have any common sense. Bless your word today, Lord. We're going to give you all the honor, praise, and glory in our precious name. Amen. Amen. For you that have your Bibles, turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7. And by the way, this is repeated not only in the Old Covenant, but it's repeated in John chapter 12, verse 38, in that particular area. It's repeated in several of those verses, and I picked out 38 because the exact quote, who hath believed our report? That's the main part of the theme of who will believe our report. And of course, that report is the number one most important report known to mankind. It's talking about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. And of course, his shed blood and resurrection. If everyone has it and we're ready, let's look at this together. Right away, Isaiah says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him like a tender plant, we're talking about Jesus, and like a root out of the dry ground, he hath no form of comeliness, and when we shall see him, there shall be no beauty that we should desire of him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him 
and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. One more verse. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. <clears throat> He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. That phrase is repeated, and much of that passage is repeated in John chapter 12, verse 38. This theme that we have been talking about, and this is the fourth night, we're going to do one more at least is the Word of God slash America. Throughout the Word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, you will find tribute, memorial, altar. From one side of the Bible, Genesis through Revelation, there's a reason for that. And thank God, the forefathers that put in place all the writs that we've been talking about, the Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, they took phrases right out of the Word of God, and this country was established upon those things and upon the very type and, and, and shadows and even the existing positions in the Word of God for government. That's how this country was established on biblical government. One of these days, all the government's going to be on his head. In the last, when he comes to reign and rule forever. Right now, Satan's the prince and power of the air, but greater is he that sent us. We born again believers and he in the world. <laughs> Satan is having a field day right now. But one of these days that's all going to change because when we give our heart and life to Jesus Christ, we're more than conquerors even here on this earth. In Genesis it says, Noah built an altar. Joshua built an altar. Altars are presented throughout the Word of God. And the greatest altar that's ever been known to man is in the New Covenant, the cross of Jesus Christ, where He laid down His life over 2,000 years ago, shed His blood that you and I might have redemption through His blood and cleansing. We need to remember it's important for memorial, it's important for the remembrance of memorial, it's important for altars, and for heaven's sake, yes, tribute, that in all things he might have the preeminence. I want to share some more with you. In God we trust, this nation under God. This caption says, Monuments to American Patriotism. It is amazing that at a time when such a concerted effort is underway to erase the role of God and faith in America's public life, our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., is filled with Christian religious symbols that adorn its buildings and monuments as an abiding evidence of God's role in America's her heritage. From the halls of Congress to the monuments to nearby every landmark building, biblical and religious quotations and images are inscribed and preserved as an official testimony to the true place God has in our nation's birthright and history. 
the Washington Monument. That's that tall monument that we see on a regular basis. Engraved on the aluminum capstone is the Latin phrase, Los Dio, which means praise be to God. Lining the walls of the stairway or the stairwell are carved tribute blocks that declare such biblical phrases as holiness to the Lord, search the scriptures, and the memory of the just is blessed, and train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now I want to remind you, it's just been a few weeks ago, that the intent was that there was a mob that wanted to take that down. That's when the president, whether you like him or not, said, you're not doing that. And he sent in military, whichever one it was, that they would squelch that and those other places that they wanted to tear down. Can you imagine a country without law and order? Mm -hmm. I have in my briefcase, I, there's not time to read that, but I, I got it in the mail last night. What's happening in San Francisco right now, that there is so much urine and feces in the street that it's so hard to breathe. It's a place of filth, along with even people on the street, out in the open, shooting up with heroin right in the streets. It's happening in Los Angeles. Look who's in charge over there, would you? Look who's in charge in these states and these cities. Look who is in control of it. You're going to vote in a few days. People say, oh, you need separation of church and state. I beg your pardon. What I'm trying to do is reach in and pull it back where it's supposed to be. And God in heaven help us if the wrong party gets in this next time. Because you ain't seen nothing yet if they do. They're after our Bibles. They're after our guns. They're after our freedom. They're, they're after everything sacred. Can't believe such nonsense. This is not the same country our forefathers fought and died for. But there's still a lot of people. And what needs to happen is vote. I understand the evangelicals are going to stand up again this time. Well, I'll tell you what, they better. Because if they don't vote right, they're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I don't even want to be standing by them then. They don't vote like they're supposed to vote. Amen. Pretty strong, huh? I hope you understand I'm fighting for America. I love America, and I love the freedom, and I want to be able to go anymore on 75 years old. I want to go ahead and preach until the day I die. It'll be with a microphone and a Bible in my hand when I leave this life. Amen. As long as we have the proper government. But if not, my fear is I won't be able to do that. Unless it's in a cell preaching to a bunch of inmates and maybe the caregivers, keepers, whatever they want to call it. No people can be bound to acknowledge and adorn the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than those of the United States. George Washington says in the return of the paintings of the baptism of Pocahontas and also the embarkation of the pilgrims that show the pilgrims praying on shipboard led by William Brewster. Clearly seen in an open Bible are the words, the New Testament, according to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the words God with us are inscribed on the sail of the ship. In the Capitol's chapel is a stained glass window depicting George Washington prayer under the inscription, This Nation Under God. Also the prayer from Psalm 16.1 is etched in the window, which states, Preserve me, God, for in thee do I put my trust. Amen. Here's a good one. Something special, I think, is happening tomorrow. Some folks don't like it, but I say, Thank you, Lord. In the Supreme Court. It's time something good happened over there again. Maybe we can get some things straightened out. The Supreme Court building has a number of places where there are images of more Moses with the Ten Commandments. Moses is included among the great lawgivers 
in Herman McNell's marble sculpture group on the east front as you enter the Supreme Court courtroom. The two hinge doors have Ten Commandments engraved on each lower portion of each door and a display of the Ten Commandments is also engraved over the chair of the Chief Justice. I'm almost done. The Jefferson Memorial. When you enter the Jefferson Memorial, you will find many references to God. A quote that runs around the interior dome says, I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the minds of man. One of the panels reads, God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can these liberties of a nation be secured when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just that his justice cannot sleep forever. One more, the Lincoln Memorial. Millions have entered the Lincoln Memorial and gazed upon the magnificent statu stature of Abraham Lincoln. His famous speeches are inscribed into the walls on the left side of the Gettysburg Address. He said, we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, and that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. On the right side of Lincoln's second inaugural address, which mentions God 14 times and quotes the Bible twice, he concludes with a lament over the destruction caused by the Civil War and appeals to charity in healing the wounds of the war with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right of God gives us to see the right let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish the just and lasting peace among ourselves with all nations. I don't know how anyone could hear the proof that I have just read you and not believe that report. This is not something that some organization or religious entity or some denomination put in place. This is history. And see what's happening right now, we've talked about this before. In this country, Whatever history is being taught, unless it's some special school, history is not taught like it was when we were young. We had history that was accurate. Amen. We were taught civics. We were taught we were taught what was proper government. You know the amazing thing is, I remember growing up, it's always been especially the two parties that have their own opinion how to run a country. And even though sometimes it might have been a little bit fiery, there was still a dignity for the most part. Here we hear recently when our president was strict, stricken with the COVID, people were saying, even in the news media, we hope he dies. Mm -hmm. People from Hollywood says, I'm pulling for the COVID, which meant they wanted him to succumb to the disease. Who in their right mind would ever wish for someone to be dead? Mm -hmm. It's one thing to say, Lord, don't let them be in office. It's another thing to say, I want them dead. I've mentioned it again. And one thing that bothered me is the last, the last president we had who said, he went over to the foreign countries overseas and said, I want to apologize for America and we're not really a, a Christian nation anymore. Mm. Mm. Evidently, he didn't have one of these 
these Bibles, and I know for even if he didn't have one of them, he was in Washington, D.C. Did he not see the monuments? Did he not see those designated memorials? Or was he just spiritually blind? I think that resonates Amen better. There. People say, oh, that's not nice talking like Listen, we're fighting for America right now. We're, we're basically in a spiritual war. Amen. Amen on that. Yeah. I, I can't understand why I'm not hearing more talk like this from preachers. I don't know. Are they afraid that somebody's going to bomb the house? I mean, uh -huh. you know, I look at it this way. If that's the way I have to go, I'm a still a winner. I hope the Lord would protect me. But right now, it's put up or shut up. I firmly believe that. I love this country. And I beg your pardon. We still are a Christian nation. I don't care how many Muslims come in here or how many whatever else come in here. We're still a Christian nation. Amen. And, and I'll tell you one thing. God's people better stand up or the blood's going to be on our hands. Because the buck stops right here. That's one thing Truman had on his desk. He had a plaque up there that says, The buck stops here. You know that he did not finish, when, he did not go to college. He only finished high school. But he had horse sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know, he was a Democrat. That's back when they had a party. A good party. I'll amen that. That doesn't mean that everything is corrupt. There's just a lot of corruption there. Understand that. Right now, I don't care what party it is, we're fighting what is the closest thing to the Word of God. This is where it's at. And if you don't know how to vote, and some Christians don't, I don't understand that. Unless you've been laying out of church and your Bible's got dust all over it. Because... I would know in a heartbeat what to vote for. This Bible tells me how to vote. Started out in Sunday school. The B-I-B-L-E. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. This is it. No other text, no other writ. This covers it all. I'm praying that we would fast and pray as necessary for the most important election that this country has ever had. I don't know of another more important election because there's too much on the line. We need to have law and order back in place. We need to have our religious rights reinstituted, not taken away. We need to be once again prospering. This disease, this disease has got to be eliminated. I'm going to tell you something else. If God's people will get right, don't be surprised that the disease will go away. Amen. I know that's pretty strong, Bill. Oh, isn't that some radical? Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm telling you right now. He says, if my people, which are called by my name. See, sin can go so far that even the, 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 the terra firma gets violated. Even crops would not grow in Habakkuk's time. But he said, no matter what happened, he said, I will still praise the God of my salvation. And remember this, no matter what, God is still on the throne. Mm -hmm. And he reigns forever. Mm -hmm. I know this is really hard for a lot of people to accept, but my question is, do you know the God that I'm talking about? Do you know God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? You see what I'm talking about? That is a triune God that we serve, yet there's one God. And the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, God 
came to this earth, became flesh. It says, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. He had to become man, even though he was God. He never lost that, but he still was, was God, and he was still man. But he laid his life down on the cross of Calvary. God had to do that through Jesus Christ, because God could not die, but the man could. And on the third day, he rose from the grave that you and I might have eternal life. The price was paid over 2,000 years ago. The only thing that you and I need to do because Jesus paid it all is say, Lord, I receive you as Lord and Savior. Forgive me my sin and come into my heart. That's all it takes right there. Believing he died upon the cross and rose again. One of these days, it's a little song we earlier sang. There's a mansion over the hilltop being prepared for all of us that know him. It says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. Right now, I want to pray for you. Lord, for these people that have spent the time to listen and stay with us, I pray, Lord, that whatever the situation is in their life, that you give them what they stand in need of. As this goes out over the airwaves and continues to go even this next week and on down the weeks after, Lord, I just pray that the listener would receive what we've said and take it to heart, Lord. May they understand there's a God that loves them. And he's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. Lord, I pray that if there be some that have tonight given their heart to you, I pray, Lord, they'd let us know about it. One thing about it we may not know now, but one of these days we'll know on the other side. So you said in the, your, your Bible, your word, that my word will not return void, so I know that it will not return void. I know that it's going to take effect, and we're counting on that in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, for this election that's coming up. Lord, I pray, God, that the people would vote according to the word of God, that we might secure our freedoms once again. We're going to ask this in the precious name of Jesus. In my name, amen. Amen. Thank you and good night.